After serving as the chairman of the Church of Pentecost worldwide for 10 years, Apostle Professor Pokunina is set to retire in August this year. His tenure saw the introduction of numerous reforms which drew some fierce opposition from members of the church. Will he be remembered as a reformer who took the church to the next level or as someone who sacrificed cherished traditions of the church on an altar of modernity? My guest for tonight is Apostle Professor Pokunina, the chairman of the Church of Pentecost, and you are watching The Hard Truth. We are proudly brought to you by Murphy Homes, our industrial city and Paul's Fitness Gym. My name is Nana Akusia Kunidwa Santi Samuels. This is The Hard Truth and we are proudly brought to you by Murphy Homes, Dawa Industrial City and Paul's Fitness Gym. Uh, our guest tonight is um, Professor Opoku Onyina, he's the chairman of the Church of Pentecost and uh, my name is Nana Akosia Kunidu. Chairman, welcome to the Heart Truth. Thank you very much. It's okay. been like a very long time arranging for this interview, but we thank God we made it this yeah, time yes, out. Yes, but that's really, good to go. yes, you are 64, but you look super young. What's your secret? Seriously. Um, well, first of all, I would say that it is the grace of God. Then also, I check the type of food I eat. You don't eat fufu, you don't eat banku, you don't. What do you eat? Uh, well, normally, I don't like fufu, but. Um, Occasionally, uh -huh. I may take it. Maybe for about three or four years, I don't remember the last time I took it. Wow. It doesn't mean that the food is not good. <laughs> I mean, was going to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I have a menu. Right. Which I do myself. And that you like I to review share. it every week. Technically, tell us what you take on Monday. Monday is what you eat. Yeah, Monday I take TZ. Oh my, every Monday, <laughs> wow, and the green sauce, yes, that thing, the yeah, soup, teaser, right, yeah. <laughs> TZ and what, so TZ and then in the afternoon, yeah, TZ, of course, we have those uh, greens and all those things, uh, yeah, uh, along, then I usually like fruits, so I don't so maybe long, fruits in the morning, yeah. no oats, no cocoa, no, I take, I, I, in the morning, I'll take oats, uh, any type of porridge, but I draw it, Mm -hmm. uh, if, as I'm saying that I would take a uh, tease it, mm -hmm. if I use millet, I prefer the millet type. Mm -hmm. Millet. But there's it. a corn type. Is not there a corn, corn type? Or not the, a corn, the millet, millet in the north. Right. Yeah, we have two types. You said you prefer that. I'm yes. asking if there is a variation. Yeah, you there's, a... we have the corn type of, uh, mm. no, they have the concunte type of <laughs> uh, uh, tease it. Right. But what I'm talking about is the, the northern type of tease uh -huh. with grains okay yes. so in the morning i may take porridge or oats yeah i take it and then in the evening it depends i may take something like couscous it's a french type of food that is yeah, for us to have <laughs> <rough for some. laughs> but really great to have you on the yes, show sir. So right glad. but in the past the church of pentecost you know uh was seen as a standard for um, um it's uh, spirituality focused on spirituality yeah. with biblical teachings and strict adherence to um christ-like living but however in recent times some have accused that there is a dilution of doctrine, mm -hmm. um, relaxing of certain long-held principles mm -hmm. and uh, preoccupations to, you know, changing the church to, uh, negatively. Uh, this notion that the church is losing its character, is that how you see it? Is, is the church of Pentecost losing its character? Yeah, many people do not understand spirituality. My area is African Pentecostal spirituality. Mm -hmm. And if you are talking of spirituality, it does not exclude education. You see, besides Jesus, the two most spiritual persons in the Bible are Moses and Paul. Very spiritual in the Old Testament. Right. Now, if you take Moses, he had to study in the palace of Pharaoh for 40 years, where he learned government, how to govern a nation. He was trained as a military leader. He also learned the code at that time, how to use laws itself. In other words, he learned law. And then he also learned agriculture because Egypt was very good in agriculture. He learned that from the palace of Pharaoh for 40 years. Then after that, miraculously, God asked him to go and learn priesthood. And this priesthood too, he learned it from, in fact, in Egypt, he picked their type of priesthood, which we would term as idolatry. 
uh, or paganism. He picked some aspect. Right. And then God asked him to go to uh, uh, media. When he went to media, there was a priest called uh, Jethro. That is where, in fact, he, met, he married the daughter of, of, of Jethro called Zipporah. Now, that Jethro is quite interesting personality. He was a media, and media was a son to Keturah, who was the second wife of Abraham. Mm -hmm. When Sarah died, mm -hmm. he was the person that Abraham married. And he was a priest at that time. And he was a priest to who? God. Worshipping God. So through Abraham, media had learned priesthood. And then Jethro had picked it. Remember, this man Jethro is the one who taught Moses how to govern. Right. With, with leadership principle that is still applied in many, many places. Mm -hmm. So God had to ask him to go and study there for another 40 years. Mm -hmm. Then also learn how to shepherd a uh, flock. Now, this Moses is the same person who encountered God in the burning bush. So you see that he was spiritual, meeting God, God speaking to him, but had also had very good education. Mm. So spirituality goes with education. Mm -hmm. Paul too, he was the most learned among the apostles in the New Testament. A lawyer by profession, then, then also studied under Gamaliel, a respected Pharisee, and as such he was a Pharisee. And he had to tell Timothy that study to show yourself approved. That education, you're talking about education and studying to show yourself approved. Let's look at the rules of wearing of scarves yes. and acceptance of, you know, dreadlocks for first time, as you said, wearing of trousers by women and so on, where relaxed during your tenure, I would say. What basis, again, I'm asking, did the founding fathers of the church initially use in putting these rules in place since they were dropped mm. as not being biblical? Yeah. The Church of Pentecost has few things that are conventional. They are not constitutional. If I'm saying they are not constitutional, it means they are not written in our constitution. And some of them too are not written in any document of us. Beside the constitution, we have something like the ministerial manual, minister's right. manual, that actually deals with other practices, practices beside the constitution of the church. And there are some things that are not in these document and others. Right. Some of those things are the covering of hair. And also certain arrangement, men certain We had arrangement. men of God who started the church. They yeah. said we should put on scarves. Yes, I'll and come it to was that one. fine. So what 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 necessitated the change in that? Yes, I'm saying that um, so we have these conventions that are not written anywhere. Right. So for instance, certain arrangement was not written in any Document. The men should wearing, sit there and the women yes, sit there. Not written in any way. Uh -huh. The wearing of scarf, not written anywhere. Mm -hmm. Trices, women trices. You, you know that we have women trices and yes. women shirt, yes. women suit coat. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the women one will have the, the button on the left. But many people do not know that. And the issue of trices and suits uh, was carried to us. This issue was carried to us from. Westerners. Mm -hmm. It wasn't part of our culture. Mm -hmm. Men have adopted this. So if a woman, for instance, put on a, 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 a man a, trouser, a, yes, a women's, a women's <laughs> uh, 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 trousers, what is wrong with that? Mm. Now, as I'm saying that, it's not written in any way. Pastor McHugh was someone who was being led by the Spirit. So are, or so were the other leaders of the church. Pastor McHugh was not legalistic at all. You can have some uh, some of the pictures of Mama Sophia. Other times she will put on some headgear. Other times too, without it. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, there were other missionaries who also came. So what? Did God speak to you directly and no, said, no, no, "My no, no, son, no. I needed to change the rules." So and... as as he left, some of these things became legalized. They became legalized, right. and people were were paying too much attention from these things, and then blocking other people from coming to the church. Mm. For instance, if a woman was a police in trousers, she could not come because she was in trousers. So right. a doctor uh, coming to church in such seat, she would have to, in fact, the doctor told me of her experiences where she needed to go and change before coming to church because she didn't want to be others to, to embarrass her by putting on such clothes. But 
they are not evil mm -hmm. once they are decent. So we thought that things that are not necessarily biblical but could become hindrance to others coming to know Christ, we, we must not put too much emphasis on it. So if somebody <laughs> comes to, for instance, a church, as you are with, with me now before right. God, <laughs> <laughs> and therefore we are still within the church setting, uh, without a hair gear, that person to be, should be allowed to worship God. There is nothing right. wrong. Right, but, but, but so many of the members <laughs> of the church, yeah. you know, received uh, the communique. They did not receive the communique in good faith. In mm. fact, some of the elders, I think, uh, somewhere in the pursuing in the Western region were quite vocal. Mm. Let me ask you, how did you handle the opposition? Yeah, I knew that many people would fight against it. But I tried to, to, to explain, first of all, to... Um, in fact, the whole thing came from what we call the College of Apostles and Prophets. Mm. They are the traditional leaders of our doctrine and practices. So I had to give a message. The message was centered on uh, being transformed in the image of Christ. In your generation. In, I yes, that. in the new generation, right. a contemporary generation. And when I gave that message and then allow apostles and prophets to have workshop on the message, then these issues came out. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was expecting that. Right. That was my goal. But I wanted it to come from them. So through the, the ministry did what actually it needed to do. Mm. So the apostles and the prophets brought out the issues. This has become a hindrance. This has become a hindrance. They brought the issue. Then how should we deal with the issue? No, but, I, but personally, mm -hmm. when you, some, some of them even said he was going to die, we're going to pray that you die. I mean, you're human. So if you hear your own elder saying yeah. some of these things about you, how, how would you feel? How I knew feel those things were coming. I Are you knew, scared? Yeah, I knew that it will cause chaos that people may find it. So I tried the education. Right. But I didn't know. What I didn't know was that the media will pick it the way the media pick it. Right. For that one, I didn't know. But I knew that church members would find it, some, some of them would find it very difficult. But I thought it was good for the church and for the future of the church too. So when it came, I had prepared for that. I, I knew, I had dreamt four times within two weeks mm -hmm. that uh, there, there was a plane, I was in a plane flying and the plane was trying to land and it was like crashing wow. until the fourth one where there was a bigger plane guiding the smaller one and it had to guide the small one to land safely. So I knew and then I called the acting general secretary at that time that this is what I've, I've seen, pray about it. I called Prophet Aminyampo who was around to to pray about it. Mm -hmm. So when they were doing that, I thought that genuinely, I thought uh, I, that uh, how should I? The way I tried to get a better vocabulary, not to offend people, I thought that some of them had not reached that level of being tolerant to issue that uh, that, that do not go against the Bible, but have become church tradition. Mm. No, so I, I, I realized that they had not gone to that level. But sir, I get that. I, I want to get your personal feeling. How, how did you... I took it normal. It was normal for you. For normal but, for you. But you introduced uh, numerous reforms, uh, yes. you know, into the once conservative church, I would say. Something which many members, you know, opened and criticized. So did you come in as a reformer? I mean, was that your motive to come in as someone to, to bring in new rules? Was that your motive? No, I did not come in um, <laughs> as a reformer. Right. Um, right from the beginning of my ministry, I mm -hmm. had a special encounter with God. Mm -hmm. So my, my ministry has been on Christ and Him crucified, the cross of Christ, and then the love of God exhibited through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my ministry has centered on Christ, Him crucified, His cross, mm -hmm. and God's love. And whenever I see that something is not biblical, and people's attention are being drawn to that, or that thing is causing what I think havoc in the church of God. I try to do what I think pleases God. Mm. So in my attempt to do or to follow the principles of the Bible, people see it as reformation. Mm. So for me, it is trying to apply the biblical principles 
in a normal way. I see, but culture we know is dynamic and change is yeah. inevitable. But um, as the Church of Pentecost introduces, uh, you know, uh, changes in their old age traditions and practices, how cautious again are you of not sacrificing cherished values of the altar, uh, you know, in modernity sense? Yeah, as a theologian, I'm aware of things that are biblical and theological. Mm. And then I'm aware of things that are that are traditional. Mm. And um, by the grace of God, um, I've been in the ministry for 42 years, having the opportunity to be called into the ministry during the <laughs> chairmanship of Pastor McHugh, mm -hmm. at least for six years before he mm -hmm. retired, then seeing the first African chairman working directly under Apostle Safu as his district pastor. So I know what the Church of Pentecost is really meant to be. Sometimes when I hear some people saying that uh, this is not how the Church of Pentecost is, maybe that young man about 30 years old, and I was a pastor mm -hmm. before even he was born. Uh, 40 years, I was still a pastor. When I hear some of these people, I say they don't know what they are talking about. Pastor McHugh was not someone who was interested in do's and don'ts at all. Very, very spiritual person leading according to what the Bible says. So I consider that people don't really know mm. what they, 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 they are saying about spirituality. So the cherished things, we cannot cherish somebody like sitting position. It's not something that we should cherish. Things like, if for instance, somebody with a, a, a dreadlock, a rasta right. is trying to come to church and you stop the person, it's not a cherished tradition. I mean, um, somebody who, are, who has put on, let's say, a decent uh, prizes coming to church, suit, ladies pants or something of that nature, and you stop the person. Mm. I mean, that is not a cherished. Our tradition should be displaying the quality of Christ outwardly, speaking with you, putting on a decent dress wherever I'm coming from. Even if you say that you are putting on clothing, mm -hmm. the clothing itself that you are putting on can be very bad. The way a manner it, 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 it fits you, it's you, tight. It fix you, mm. exposing part of your body. Mm -hmm. You know, all those things are not good. That means it's not modest. So I believe that people actually sometimes cherish the wrong thing. Mm. But I prefer people cherishing Christ in the center of our worship and displaying that through their communications with others, their interactions with others, coming out through their outward appearances to dressing and other things. You've led the Church of Pentecost mm -hmm. for 10 years now. Uh, in what ways, you know, has your chairmanship transformed the church um, to make it a greater impact in, in Christian dance? Yeah, yeah, thank God for that. Um, as you said, actually, my chairmanship started in a very hard condition. Mm. Um, so I started with many challenges, which I consider as part of life. The first one was that before coming, there had been a prophecy to nominate somebody to be considered for the chairmanship, right. which the College of Apostles and Prophets did not accept as journey, mm -hmm. as God has spoken. And the, 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 the voting at that time was very close. 54 people say, this does not come from God. 52 saying, this comes from God. Three abstentia. Mm -hmm. So you see a divided front. Right. It was after this one before the executive nominated me and then I came forward. So when I came forward, anything that I was bringing... Did you know, did, did God speak to you that um, you know, you'll be the next chairman of the Church of Pentecost? Yes, I, was, I knew about that. And one. you knew at that, that same time that it was that it, same yeah, year? It started very, it started very, very early. But did he give you timelines and said, you know, 10 years back dated, you know, you'll be... Yeah, what, what gave me a clue about the timeline but when I started, it, it happened when I started as an overseer, that first year. Mm. Then I had a divine encounter. Then three years time, a prophet, an ordained, of the, a, a ordained prophet of the church, right. prophesied. Mm -hmm. When I was being ordained as a pastor, mm -hmm. you know, Church of Pentecost has a system. You enter as an overseer, then later you are ordained as a pastor. Then the, that prophet, Prophet Thomas Nyako, said that, I was, I was going to be ordained and, uh, uh, and anointed in the, in, in the anointing of David. And enemies will come against me, but God will preserve me. Then I'll become the mouth and the eyes of the church and the last 
of the greatest. Mm. Perhaps that was trying to say that I may be the last person who rubbed shoulders with the, uh, the founding fathers. Now, he said that earlier. Then, about five or six years' time, Prof, uh, Apostle Safo mm -hmm. was dying. But he was dying maybe about eight years' time. And he was asked in the UK, where through God's sovereignty, I had been asked by the Executive Council to go and study. So I was there. The Elim, uh, Church of Pen the Elim Pentecostal Church brought a tip to him and said that the doctors had said that you have 15 days to live. Mm. So if you have anything to tell the church, speak and you carry it to the church. And he said that if God had spared my life, I was training somebody to take over from me as a chairman. And then he mentioned my name. Mm -hmm. But I prayed at that time and God said, no, what I've told you would take a very long period. So I knew that that was not the right time. And this was 87. 87. And what God said fulfilled in 2008, 2008. Mm -hmm. So how many years? About uh, 30. Yeah, about 31 years uh, later that what he said right. uh, fulfilled. So I knew it would take time. Mm. So when this prophecy came and it was rejected and I started, I started with somehow a divided front. So bringing any issue was quite difficult but God granted great grace. And as I said, because I had been in the church for quite a long time, some of the things that I thought that were trying to penetrate, that we needed to deal with, I had to handle. Some of these things had issues with money. Apostle to me had tackled it, but it had not been successful as right. the executive council wanted. So how to raise offering, for instance, by calling names, 1,000, 2,000. I believe that offering should be voluntary. You should not call names that I want 10 people to give 10,000 or who would like to give 1,000 or 10,000. Let it be very free. So we were able to bring that reforms. Then offering three times, four times within a service where we have to come in the executive. I had to lead them to come with a policy that no, we do not accept more than two offerings at a meeting. No. And the two offerings you are only allowed on Sunday because you may take tithes and a second offering for other local things. Beside that, no, there shouldn't be that. So you were able to do that one. Then things like farewell services of um, ministers. ministers, there were a whole lot of uh, murmuring uh, around the farewell and retirement service of uh, um, church leaders where targets and other things were, were given. And you said, no, you should not give any targets. Set some days aside. You raise offering, whatever you get for the pastor, give it to him. If, if he gets 50 Ghana cities. If he gets 50 Ghana cities, <laughs> give it to him. I so see. that it will be uh, voluntary. Then for the area head, all the members within the area were, were supposed to meet, gather at one place with a big canopy elected for that person. That one to let's cancel it. Um, we would have to find the biggest uh, building within the, the area. area. And then you hold it in with representatives from the other districts. What stopped everyone from coming to see their area head off? What, what stopped them? If somebody would like to come voluntarily, you will not stop the person. But there should be church services within all the, um, the districts. But if somebody wants to come to, we do not stop mm. that person. But officially, you have to nominate people officially like the executive members and the ministry leaders to join. You see, these things help the church. Instead of losing church members for that one day, still church will go on. They will still bring in their tithes and other things, mm -hmm. and it save the church. And then monitoring all of these issues. Is it, is it money focused? You're talking about, you know, church going on. You mentioned certain examples of they bringing the monies and the church. I mean, is it just the money you no, focus on? No, it, it seems you missed the first part. I Listen. said still church service will go on. So when you have a church service, you come in, speakers, they will, they will still leave their homes, come to church, they will pray, they will listen to the, the word of God, and they will still give yeah, their okay. offerings for the church and their own local uh, as they will do it on that day without bringing all of them. And it was not possible that all of them could come. We'll be right back. <laughs> Yeah.
Welcome back. You are still watching The Hard Truth and we are proudly brought to you by Murphy Homes, Dawa Industrial City and Pulse Fitness Gym, Chairman of the Church of Pentecost, Apostle Professor Opoku Onyina. Kojo Opoku Onyina, are you still here? <laughs> so, right, when you assume the mantle of the chairmanship, mm -hmm. what were some of um, the administrative uh, challenges that you encountered and how effectively did you deal with them? administrative challenges. Right. Well, the Church of Pentecost had already set up a very good administrative structure with the chairman being assisted <laughs> by the general secretary. So the general secretary assists the chairman mm -hmm. uh, at the head office. Right. And the general secretary I met was a very hard working person, Apostle Dr. Alfred Kudria, and who had also been in the uh, ministry for quite a long time. So at the head office, everything was going on okay. Maybe if I was, I had a challenge. You know, in, in Ghana and um, Africa, sometimes when somebody is disciplined, mm -hmm. you have other people coming to you. Mm -hmm. And um, But I'm someone, once something like that has happened, I wouldn't like to be influenced to overturn uh, maybe uh, such a decision if it was done in the right uh, mold. Um, so this, some, some of the challenges too were, Sometimes, uh, instead of people going to their district passes or area heads, they would like to directly come to the they chairman. Either write to you, either call you, or try to seek an appointment to come and visit mm -hmm. on an issue. An issue comes, and you know that a presiding elder could have dealt mm. with the issue. But you needed to be very patient with those people so that you wouldn't let them be discouraged and destroy the confidence that they have in the highest um, um, uh, office the in church, the church. Right. So you have to guide against the, the office. Besides that, I thought the administration was quite effective. And I see. Well. But sir, th there are, you know, perceptions that yeah. some pastors are uh, transferred to underdeveloped communities yeah. or kept in such locations for yeah. long if they have divergent, you know, views from leadership. Mm -hmm. Are the processes and procedure for transfers transparent enough? Can I say that? Are they transparent enough, sir? Yeah, our transfer system too is quite interesting. Right. Um, um, because um, we have area heads mm. who would have to make some recommendations after the person has been in the station for five, six, seven or more years. They will recommend to the executive to transfer the person. And they, they do not have... Is it true? So let's say I don't agree with you. I'm in your area. I'm a pastor in an area and I don't agree with the area head. Well, um, so the area head said, I'll show you, Pa. Mm -hmm. Then he's transferred to some, you know, hinterlands or some remote area. But it, it, Is there a special criteria, Apostle, to mm -hmm. select or, you know, in taking your ministers on, on transfers? You see, it's not all the area heads who are members of the Executive Council. Uh -huh. Out of 63 areas... About, let's see, um, nine of them, mm -hmm. or 11 of them, mm -hmm. as I can see, are members of the executive. So how can that area head, who is not a member of the executive, transfer Is there no is consultation no, with the areas before? No, the area heads would recommend the pastor. Uh, we have um, recommendations made by the area heads that are there, it comes to the chairman office. Then when the person is five years, six years, we will transfer, the executive council will transfer. Then we try to see the gifts, if the person is gifted in a special area, area, we will try to push the person to the area. So um, there are no biases. Hmm. There is no system that is perfect. There can be one or two maybe a genuine mistakes. And give an, an example, we spoke to some pastors of the church. Yeah. They confirmed that they've been to, excuse my language, villages, mm -hmm. all their ministry. Is that fair? You see, we think of, um, we think of the work of God. Mm -hmm. I personally, even as the chairman, I'm surprised about some people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if you, for instance, my younger brother, one of my younger brothers is in the ministry and he was transferred to a plan, a firm place. Mm -hmm. And somebody was, oh, why should you go to a, a firm place? And I said, who should go who there? Should go there? <laughs> I mean, who should go there? Mm. It's an area that somebody should go. People, are, people sometimes have a different motive of coming to the ministry. 
And if you have a different motive of coming to the ministry, God may have to prune you. God may have to prune you. Um, but shouldn't so, so, ministers taste mm -hmm. everything? So you taste the village, you come to the, you know, the towns, and you go to the city. So they have a diverse and, and you know, a, a unique ministry. Should it be village-centered all yeah, the time? My, so. my concept of God is sometimes quite different from some people. For me, mm -hmm. I believe God is in control of my life mm -hmm. as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And he causes all things together for me. And then he knows how to steer my affairs. So wherever I go, God is in. Mm. If I need to go to anywhere that I go, whether somebody may call it, call it a village, a town, a city, mm -hmm. God will want me to go and do something there. So my concern is not where right. you go, but the God who is steering the affairs of my life. And, and, and one time I was telling one pastor, every head, when he was called as an area head, appointed, he went to a place, immediately he went there, there was a major problem with the mission house, his residence. The whole thing would have to be, the roofing had to be done, a whole renovation, he had right. to leave the house. He was posted to the second station. This same thing happened. Mm -hmm. The same thing, I only dedicated his new residence <laughs> during the Easter. So when I met him, I said, we pray, we don't know the next place you go. Maybe <laughs> God has given you this special grace. Mm. So God deals with people differently. Mm -hmm. And I believe that when you come to the ministry, you, you, you just have the motive of serving God. It is, the, it is that same Lord who directs your faith. One time, you see, I travel <clears throat> with people. Mm. Sometimes I'll go to a place, hear about the pastor. So I, when I visit a place... I do sometimes uh, ask people to come and share what they have heard from their pastors concerning the themes. And one time I went to a place, for instance, one pastor's name was mentioned several times. Then I called the area head, the town. Give me this pastor, I want to travel with him. Other time too, I would just see an area head. Recommend somebody from among your area, I want to travel with him. Mm -hmm. So I have different ways. One time I decided just to look at the pastors and pick a name. Mm -hmm. Just... I'm just looking at the pastors. I want to pick a name. I don't know the person. So I pick a name. I was in fasting and prayers, of course, 10 days. And I decided that I'll do that. I felt the Lord was speaking to me. And I pick a pastor. Mm -hmm. When I travel with Tim to a district, there were two that I traveled that day. And I asked him to preach. The place that he preached, the area said, area head came to tell me that. Uh, chairman, I'm surprised. I said, what well, he said? The message really fits the area. Mm. You see, so these things, when I saw the ministry of that person, later on, we had to transfer him to Handel because I, I realized that he was very well endowed with grace. But that's how it came about. I see, but who is this person? Uh, uh, this <laughs> person I, right. who is this person? Uh, I am talking <laughs> about, um, he's called Jamuna. Jamuna. Yes, he Pastor Jamuna. Now, now in Which district? Um, now in New Tafo. I see. Do you know him? Special shout out to Pastor Jamna in New Tafo. <laughs> <laughs> but typically, pastors of the Church of Pentecost yes. do not have um, any other, you know, jobs aside, pastoring. Yes. So yes. how does the church again ensure, you know, their financial stability and comfort as they go about doing the work of the Lord? Yeah, I, I think that um, the Church of Pentecost has one of the best systems, systems of taking care about their pastors. Mm. Um, because your, 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 your accommodation will be provided freely for you. Then your travels right. will be paid for you. Your utility bills also will be paid for mm -hmm. you. And these are the essential commodities. So once you have these things, you should be able to live normally. Sir? But the salary itself is not big. The salary itself. And one of the things... Uh, at the Church of Pentecost system, that is also very extraordinary, is that the, the salary of the chairman, for instance, how, I... How much are you paying? Yeah, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, the, the salary of the chairman. Right. Uh, and that of the new overseer mm -hmm. does not have a very big How gap. much is it? So tell us. I, I told you that, I'll tell you. It doesn't have any big difference at all. Even the difference between, uh, sometimes a, a, a person can take more than the chairman. 
if you have been in the ministry more than the chairman, mm. you take bigger salary. Uh, the, my basic, my take-home salary with all the allowances is 3500 Including uh, fuel and everything. Everything. 3, that is my, my take-home but with all the allowances so the basic salary Chairman, says, that, that is you so listen, just, just imagine someone with four kids right let, and, let and, and but you, you're talking about all these nice things yes the <laughs> building the cars and the the, mm -hmm. the bills being paid for but seriously mm -hmm. how much is a thousand ghana cities mm -hmm. and how much is you know school fees and all of that so don't you think that it's about time you know something is done about it well for got fastest yeah you see taking the salaries into consideration that is why the church had to take care of the building, the traveling expenses, the uh, 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 electricity. It's not much. Uh, no, these and things, these things are important. move around <laughs> a lot. Saturday funeral, Sunday uh, our church <laughs> visiting members. Um, um, one soul, one member. It's a lot of travels. And then if you're giving him a thousand Ghana no, for all travels. of that, and it's even less, sir. Yeah. So again, is there a special uh, program in place to, to actually cater for the pastors so that they are countable, if I'm in Wale Wale or somewhere very far away? I know that the church of Pentecost is taking care of me. Is there anything like that? You, know, you see, um, though we have something special allowance given to those people in what we call, we call the um, internal missions area, like we mentioned Wale Wale, mm -hmm. in the northern parts of Ghana, and uh, coming to a place like Kintampo in Bonafo, for Eastern Region, of a front place. We have places, Vota Region to Ketekrache and Nkwanta. We consider such places internal missions. We give them special allowance, but it doesn't, it's not any big money. Mm. <laughs> um, but I think once we take care of these things, and we are given the salary, then the rest will come from the God you think has called you. You see, for instance, I came to the ministry as a young man and developed through that. And I believe that once you get these things and then go, do the part of God, mm. the rest will come to you. Sometimes, um, Chairman, the system... <laughs> our pastors of the church paid, uh, you know, similarly ac across board, you know, as other churches do. Comparing, mm -hmm. is it similar? Our, 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 our salaries. Yes. As I said, wherever you are, you take the same salary. No. So let's compare, let's say, Pentecost and Catholics. What do you think? Do you think that we are paid better? They are paid better? I mean, what's your general view? I, I, I actually don't know <laughs> the, the pay of the Catholics. Mm -hmm. They may take allowances um, differently. Uh -huh. But um, you see, the Catholic system is quite different. I was in a certain place where a Catholic priest died. Mm. And they wanted their relatives to come for their things. I mean, was it two boxes of things? And, and, and for them, that one is a higher sacrifice. Mm. Because it's a higher sacrifice. Maybe you take the Pentecost and Methodist, Presby, and other distance. But we think that. I, I think the Church of Pentecost is doing very well. Tell me, so, Tell what, me. what of motivation? I, 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 you know, apart from the salaries you talked about, and then the my cars, motivation. No, the motivation for pastors. Are, are there incentives you you know to motivate them? My motivation is the, <laughs> the call of God. <laughs> I I you see I love the ministry so much that I I I can do it without pay. Mm. If you say do it. It's something that I really love. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I don't see, when it comes to monetary issues, I don't see the challenges with money at all. But let me tell you this story. When I was at work, one time I did not have anything at all. Mm -hmm. No money, no food, completely nothing. Mm. That happens to me mm -hmm. once. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, it is the Lord who has called me. Yeah. I went to my room and prayed. Then I heard the voice saying, the Holy Spirit speaking to me, how much do you want? I said 10 cities. Then only 10 cities, I said 20. <laughs> and then... <laughs> well, was it big money then? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I came out. Within one hour, I saw a woman carrying a ball of kinky. Mm. She had never given us any, anything. <laughs> On her head, brought it to the mission house with an envelope. And then she left. When she left, I was eager and anxious to open the envelope. When I opened it, it was 26. Wow. And I said, oh, then if I knew... Could I have said, said a million. <laughs> <laughs> I see, but... So, but... so I, 
I have that strong sense of God's presence mm. that what I believe that is your need, God will provide. God will provide. That, that, that has been my motivation. But sir, how much again of a role do the church members again play in the financial stability of their pastors and does the church actually encourage them in this way? You see, the members love their pastors. Mm -hmm. Many of them give food items. Yeah. Some will give you money. Mm -hmm. Some would like to come and serve. When I was in Kumasi, some people decided to come and wash my vehicle just to come <laughs> and, and wash the vehicle for me. Mm -hmm. That was somebody vo volunteered that. He was a professional driver. He would like to come and drive me mm -hmm. wherever I was going. The members love their, their pastors that they also support through individual uh, uh, givings. That aspect also is there. Speaking to some of the members, yes. um, they tell you that passion has gone down um, because there was a communique by um, your outfit here, the mm -hmm. head office, that says that, um, you know, you can visit the mission hall, but the rules and regulations surrounding it were too much. So again, do the members have flexibility um, to actually go visit their pastors? Yes, what you said, we, we, we review what we call the ministerial welfare practices. Right. Uh, that, may be, that may be one of the things that I also brought in. And that one rather is trying to say that members should rather voluntarily visit their pastors. We do not want what we will say that church would have to sit down every month mm. and then we decide something Go and give what is pastor. wrong with that, sir? What is wrong with that? You see, we, we do, you were talking of um, some people saying that I did not agree with my apostle or something. I've been transferred to uh, a remote area mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. uh, like that. We don't want the situation where people will try to say that this is our pastor. How much are we going to give to him? Someone said 1,000, 2,000. And then they begin to fight. Someone will bypass. We say we had wanted to give you this one. Another person said no. Then it creates enmity. Won't it be easier? Giving. Won't it be easier for a communique to come from the head office that says that, well, every month the church or the district, depending on your, you know, capabilities and capacity, you can give the pastor a thousand cities. A, you know, can't step you. No, we like don't that. want to. We don't want to burden the church. It is our responsibility as the leaders to fix salaries and allowances of ministers. But when it comes to benevolence, giving, mm. we should not even burden the church. We should let individuals who feel that I want to do something, do it. You should not say that you have decided on the salary of a pastor, mm. taking other things into consideration, uh, taking other things into consideration, thinking that that should be enough. So once you do that, you have done your part. Maybe I'm seeing your background as someone coming from Mission House, and therefore you are trying to speak on behalf of... Uh, <laughs> fellow, <laughs> fellow no. So I'm seeing that you are oh being biased. Goodness. I'm not being biased. No, I'm this not. Is you know this what? Truth. You this, see, is this is hard truth. Or stuff for us for this way. <laughs> no, I'm, I am coming from the mission house, yes. But exactly. So that gives me the upper hand to know the issues. On interactions with some of these pastors, yes. they're like, well, you know, why can't our members come is home it? and all of that? So, so why is that again? You see, um, interestingly, um, yeah, interestingly, members can go to pastor's house. You have to visit the pastor. Mm. If you have a gift, you can give it, but it should not be mandatory. You know, once you do something mandatory, you know, once you mandate people, go and do that, go and do that, you are issuing a law that will kill. I and see. they wouldn't do it from their heart. And that will not bring blessings to the people. So, so tell me, you will, there come, will there come a time, pastors, so you talked about 3,000, will there come a time where pastors, you know, go to the bank and they check their accounts and it's 5,000? Each. No, for me, Will there come that time? <laughs> no, for me, maybe I sense the grace of God. I believe strongly that God is behind this. Once we've sat down, in other words, the finance board has sat down, approved or recommended by the executive mm. council to general council and it is approved. Taking these basic things like accommodation, utility bills, transportation into consideration and giving something. Knowing that you are, you are, maybe we have somebody with a first degree studying here. This is what the person mm. is taking. 
and maybe even the accommodation has not been taken into consideration. This should be sufficient for us. And I am happy. I, I, money does not become a focus in my life at all, thinking that, um, no, they are going to increase right from the beginning of the salaries. And I must tell you that sometimes, as a pastor, when I went to council meeting, mm. and people said, waiting for finance board report, 15%, hey, some people are happy. I become surprised. For me, that was not part at all, mm. right from the inception of my ministry. I see. So, yeah, I, I don't, I don't concern. But, I believe that once we have this basic one, God will provide the rest. I saw for God will provide. Let, it, it, have it, you it, seen that convention center? Yes, I've been see, there. My Amazing. Belief, listen, Amazing. My belief was that you were not going to raise funds mm. to build that one. That we were not going to raise funds. We were not also going to stop giving of grants. And we put it up mm. without raising funds. So the God I believe in is that when he sees something as a need, <laughs> he will prove himself I faithful. See. That's the God I believe. I see. But sir, regarding the retirement <laughs> of pastors, yes. uh, there is knowledge uh, that some serve, you know, in the church for many years and, uh, you know, yet are in, found in a deplorable state upon retirement. Mm -hmm. Is this problem, uh, you know, something that you have tackled uh, proactively? Our retirement system is one of the best in the country. I see. It's one of the best in the country. Yes, um, yes, because before going out, well, we were uh, working for a scheme. <laughs> we, were, we settled a pension scheme, and uh, we didn't think we needed a SNIT. But SNIT had to come in and say that it's a policy, because we did not believe in SNIT. We didn't believe in because when people were going, they would have to go and fight and fight, and sometimes <laughs> they would have to, excuse me to say, give bribe before they could even get their own money back. Mm. And that was bad. So the Church of Pentecost established a system, but Smith wanted us to come in. Well, because we live in a, 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 a land uh, that has its own laws, we had to give in to that. However, we have established our own welfare uh, system that should support us. And the welfare system is very good. So even when somebody goes on retirement, you have a system where that welfare uh, support should be able to give that person something on mentally basis, mm. which is appreciable. I wouldn't like to mention DS publicly, but it's very appreciable. <laughs> I'm joining them in August. We'll be right back. <laughs> we'll be right back. We'll stay on. <laughs> Welcome back. You are still watching The Hard Truth and we are proudly brought to you by Murphy Homes, our industrial city and Paul's fitness gym. I'm still here with the chairman of the Church of Pentecost, Apostle Professor Kujo Upoku Onyana. <laughs> Sir, the Pentecost International Worship Centers are as a result of I would say, modernization of the church to attract and maintain expatriate and you know Africans in the diaspora to you know appeal to the youth and intellectuals. Has the PIWC concepts lived up to expectation? Yeah, at least the PIs have actually And we hear you, you are the first, you know, you are the one who started the PIWC. Yes, I to that. In fact, um, Pastor Safo and Anan who were the chairman and general secretary respectively of the church, initiated the English assemblies mm. of the Church of Pentecost within the cities, that there were some people who could not understand the local dialects within the cities. For instance, in Accra, you may have some people who will not understand the Chi language in places Chi were spoken in Ga. And therefore, why can't we establish English assemblies for them? Then when I came in as the International Missions Director, when I was elected, I was asked to be at the uh, pastor the English assemblies. There were three mm -hmm. uh -huh, with various, under various districts. But I was asked to see to the welfare of them. Then when I visited three of them, I, for me, I thought we were joking. And we needed a system where expert streets, um, Africans or Ghanaians who, whose culture have changed because of the way and manner they have may be uh, interacted with others. Mm. People study and come out with a changed mind. Mm. 
people visit other countries. So I thought we needed a system that would be multicultural approach, right. in, other, in other words, missiological approach. And that brought up the concept. And then at that time too, the issue of headgear mm. was very strong in the Church of Pentecost. Sitting arrangement was very strong. And then type of dress coming to church like coming with trices. So I thought that we need a system that would be accommodative to people who do not have our own culture. And uh, that brought about the PIs. And I think it served the purpose. In fact, when we started it, within one and a half years, we started with about 125 members. Mm. Within one and a half years, the membership had shot to 650. Like right? At at right? To about 650. And when we check Church of Pentecost members who were in, they were about one third of the people who had come there. I so I realized that it was very effective. Huh. However, some members complain a lot to them, then executive council members. What about? Um, that, oh. And we heard that there are some people who are worshipping with the Church of Pentecost, they don't cover their, their hairs, mm. and that men and women sit, uh, together. sit together. And others say that, so they, these people, they are not spiritual. And I think the fathers look at it mm. and thought that, no, um, let, let, let's, let's withdraw mm. the PIWC concept and go back to English Assembly. By English Assembly, it means it will be the normal type of Church of Pentecost and then try to follow uh, Church of Pentecost as it is. That actually stagnated the, the, the concept of the PIWCs mm. up to a certain time. Right. But fortunately, the concept, the real concept has come back. And now it's growing in many areas. You see the Kokomremre one started with 120. Now it has been divided into two. The Kokomremre one alone should be more than 1,000 members. And then Kwabinya. That was Atomic. an offshoot of Kokomremi has even over uh, grown past the Kokomremi mm. time. So you realize that um, it has become very, very useful. And it produced one missionary who has become very instrumental in our missions in India. That is okay. Pastor Raj. He was a member of the Kokomremi one. And now he's a minister, planted church in his own country. So I think, yes, it has done a good job. But although the PIWCs have contributed immensely to the growth of the church in areas of finance and human resource development and, uh, you know, retaining a lot of the youth and intellectuals in the church, um, one Yao as, um, Safu, as, uh, Ekoa, Ekoa of the PIWCs indicated, he did a research and indicated that the impact of the PIWCs, you know, um, has contributed to... Um, the fairness in evangelism and you know discipleship and all of that has the concerns we address. So we are looking at not evangelizing properly, not um, birthing new churches, but the local churches do have that. So do you think that these concerns have been addressed? Um, yeah, because the PIWCs are one concept <clears throat> that is supposed to use a common maybe international language within the system. So in Accra, that is English. Uh, in, let's say in France, it should be French. English, or in the Francophone country, too, that should be, should be French. Something that others can't come on board. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so they find it difficult opening assemblies as done by the local churches. Okay. Because within the community where the PIWC is, there should be another church, Church of Pentecost, that does evangelism of the community of planting new churches. So the PRWC will not be allowed to plant a new church as such. So their growth often comes through uh, growth within and not dividing churches as has been the, the principle or the practice of the oh, church. What of um, a one member one, so there's a policy like that. Do, do you think that PIWCs are contributing to one member one so? Yeah, they should do that. Then that is why within one and a half years, the first one was able to increase from 125 to about 650. So yeah, they do that one too. It will depend upon the evangelist ethos of the pastor. Who, who is there. Mm. And once you have somebody who is very evangelistic inclined and someone who is a teacher who can teach 
things that will attract people to mm. come. You see still the PI democracy growing. A clear example is uh, where I reside, PI democracy from Nimi, yes. a new pastor, Chris Yaka, <laughs> would actually spank you if you don't bring your member to you church. See, so, yes. yes, so I think that is really so, speaking yes. up. But, but ministers of PI WCs, you know, have attended over, you know, cross-cultural and, and across-dominated <laughs> congregants. Are such ministers uh, giving periodic orientation, uh, you know, relevant to the specialized ministry to be able to effectively address the needs of these various groups, uh, you know, that comes to the church? Yeah, I realized that that was even a lack. Mm -hmm. It was a fallow area. So um, within what I call the Vision 2018, mm -hmm. we started that. Then before someone is posted to PIWC, all those people should come for an orientation. And uh, we had to organize a special conference for PIWC officers for them to understand the concept very much. And so periodically, they will be invited again. But before you become a pastor now of a PI, you have to go through that sort of training. Mm. So I think at least um, as I exit the scene, I believe that the next chairman would continue with such idea because it helps the officers and the members of the PIWC to understand the concept and then follow up the concept.